Mr. President! Hmm. We need to hit the Oval Office immediately! Dear God, Bob. Come on, let's go. Thank you. Mr. President, there's been a break in at the Watergate Hotel. It looks like some of our men were involved. Is that, uh, <clears throat> is that Stan's operation? Marie Stan's? Uh, and it has to be, like, G. Gordon, G. Gordon Lydia. It has to be. I, I, I warned you, those guys are nuts. Uh, it, it, it doesn't matter now. If, if that's McGovern's headquarters anyway. Uh, look, uh, I don't like this any more than you do, but, uh, but the press is gonna, if they find out about this, they're gonna bury us alive. They're gonna bury all of us, and they're gonna wash away this whole presidency. And I know, I know it because they've been trying to do that since day one. They've been trying to do that since I was sworn in. And it's it's not going to operate that way anymore. What I want you to do is I want you to just cover it up. Okay, this is a this is a hunt. You will you will find that if we uncover uh, uncover a lot of things that they open that scab. There's a lot of things that we just uh, we just feel will be very detrimental. Let this let this thing go any further. Cover it up. That's the final that's the final word in the subject. Bury it. And make it look like the CIA happened. They're, they're, they're Cuban fellows, aren't they? Yes. Um, they make it look like they did it. All right. Mr. President, two dirt bags here leaked to the Washington Post about the Watergate Hotel. And who were these two dirt bags, Mr. Haldeman? A man by the name of Hunt and Colson. Boys, when I said I wanted Watergate buried, I meant buried. Colson is our main man. He is the one who has directed this whole re-election campaign, you two. Now, I'm not afraid to fire anybody. The Washington Post is public enemy number one, that's for sure. They've been out to get me since the very start. I know they have. Back in the Alger Hiss spy case, they were the ones. I'm no more. I said it in 62. They won't have Dick Nixon to kick around anymore. Bury them. Understood? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good. Now get out. Mr. President, the Washington Post has linked our finance committee to Watergate. What, what was the name of that paper again? Uh, the Washington Post, sir. I knew those liberal hippies would try and do something like this, John. And I gave the order already. I gave the order already! To blacklist them. The Post isn't supposed to know anything. Why do you think we created the plumbers in the first place? We've got to stop these leaks. This government cannot survive more leaks. This administration is the last best hope for this country. The whole reason we got here, John, is because we're honest and we're smart. And we're the best. From here on out, the Washington Post doesn't know nothing. From now on, you and Bob Haldeman are the high executioners of this government. We're going to get them on the ground, and we're, we're not going to let up until, they're, until they do what we tell them. From now on, we're in charge. Now, get, get in touch with Bob, and no one speaks to the press without my doing, got it? Yes, sir. Good, good. Now, let's, let's get on with our day. We haven't, you can't just sit around and go around the country. <laughs> Mr. Nixon, the South Vietnamese have walked out of the peace negotiations. What? How do you expect me to do my job around here, Mr. Kissinger? I promised the American people we'd have a peace deal, and by God, I'm going to get one. Even if I have to bomb Hanoi into dust. What do they think I'm trying to do here? I'm trying to save this country, not ruin it. You get out there and you get me a peace deal, understood? Yes, Mr. President. Good. Now get out. Mr. President, I know our strategy for the peace negotiations in Vietnam. <laughs> it's funny you ask me that, Henry. I, I, I call it the madman theory. You see, these, these North Vietnamese will fight forever. They, they really will. So what we're going to do I, and is, if they, I, I want you to pass along the word, saying, you know, Nixon's feeling really edgy these, these later days, and he's got his, his finger on the nuclear trigger. If we make them think that I'll drop, I'll drop the big one, then they'll do whatever we tell us, okay? Well, do, well, they'll do whatever we tell them, okay? 
what I want you to do is when you go there, you do the do, you do the deal making with the uh, with the North Vietnamese. You do would you do it with Toe or whoever they send, whoever those those dirty communists send, but whoever it is, just make sure they know that there's nothing I won't do because I'm I'm tired of being kicked. I'm sorry to tired of seeing us kicked around, okay? And I don't want us I don't want us to ever have to negotiate like we did when when Jack Kennedy was president. That's not the way we're gonna we're gonna work anymore. People people wanna criticize me for one thing, well it's not gonna be for, for passing up a peace deal. Uh, that's what I call the madman theory. If we we'll bomb Hanoi if we have to, but it'll it'll work. We I promised the American people peace and that's what I'm what I'm gonna give them, okay? Um and this is our this is our highest priority. Make sure that that those communists know there's nothing I won't do. Good evening. I have asked for this radio and television time tonight for the purpose of announcing that today we have concluded an agreement to end the war in Vietnam and bring peace with honor in Southeast Asia. The following statement is being read at this moment in Washington and Hanoi. At 12.30 Paris time today, January 23, 1973, the agreement on ending the war and restoring peace in Vietnam was, initi was initialed by Dr. Henry Kissinger on behalf of the United States and Special Advisor Lee Duck To on behalf of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. The agreement will be formally signed by the parties participating in the Paris Conference on Vietnam on January 27, 1973 at the International Con Conference Center in Paris. The ceasefire will take effect 2400 Greenwich Mean Time, January 27, 1973. The United States and the Democratic Republic of Vietnam express hope that this agreement will ensure st stable peace in Vietnam and contribute to the preservation of lasting peace in Indochina and Southeast Asia. That concludes the following statement. Throughout the years of negotiations, we have insisted on peace with honor. In my addresses to the nation from this room, on January 25th and May 8th, I set forth the goals that we considered essential for peace with honor. In the settlement that has now been agreed to, all the conditions that I laid down have been met. A ceasefire, internationally supervised, will begin at 7 p.m. this Saturday, January 27th, Washington time. Within 60 days from this Saturday, all Americans held prisoners of war who throughout Indochina will be released. There will be the fullest possible accounting for all those who are missing in action. During the same 60-day period, all American forces will be withdrawn from South Vietnam. The people of South Vietnam have been guaranteed the right to determine their own future without outside interference. By joint agreement, the full text of the agreement and the protocols it will carry out will be issued tomorrow. Just yesterday, a great American, who once occupied this office, died. In his life, President Johnson endured the vilification of those who sought to portray him as a man of war. But there was nothing he cared about more deeply than achieving a lasting peace in the world. I remember the last time I talked with him. It was just the day after New Year's. He spoke of his concern with bringing peace, with making it the right kind of peace, and I was grateful that he once again expressed his support for, for my efforts to gain such a peace. No one would have not welcomed this peace more than he. And now, I know he would join me in asking for those who died and for those who live. Let us consecrate this moment by resolving together to make the peace we have achieved a peace that will last. Thank you, and good evening. Mr. President, there's a cancer in the White House, and it's growing. John, I'm going to tell you the same thing I told Pat Gray. This whole Watergate matter is all washed up, and there's no need to continue, continue investigating it. This administration is fine, and we need to focus on the bigger problems at hand. And I warned the Washington Post, I told all the press this, this witch hunt's got to end. It's got to stop. And it stops right here, in this office, with this president. And that's the final decision on that, got it? Yes, sir. Good. You know, Mr. President, they installed a new director in the FBI. That's what I hear. <clears throat> John, did you read those papers this morning? Some fellow named John Dean is trying to bring us down. I don't like him. And you know what? I've worked too long and too hard. 
to get to this office to have a smooth now because of a couple of Cuban idiots. Do you know how long it's taking me to get to this point? You know how long. You've been there the whole way. You think they're going to let me go out screaming, mea culpa, mea culpa, I screwed up? No. No, they're not. John, I know I'm a sore loser. But I don't know how to lose. I've never known how. It's not in my vocabulary. Here's what we're going to do. Get rid of Dean. Get rid of anybody who stands in our way. This is this is it. Under, do you get it? Yeah. Because you know I, what? I understand. Because you know what? I don't think anybody else can help this country. If we let this country go down, you think anybody else could run it better than we can? Patrick Gray? No. You know, you, you know what to do, don't you? Yes, sir. That's good. Because if you don't, fire you. Listen, they're going to get me and Haldeman, but you have to protect Nixon. You only protect a madman? No, he's a hero. What are you two doing here? Go on. Come on, boys. Get inside. We got a lot of work to do. Let's go. How about it? Mr. President, we don't want to see this administration suffer anymore. So we both have decided to resign from office. I accept your decision, Bob. John, you two are uh, some of the greatest friends I've ever had. You're definitely the best, best fit for your jobs in this country's history. And I'm going to miss you. I want you to be proud of everything we've done. And don't let the press get you, because that's what this business will, will do to you. Come, come here, boys. Mr. Nixon, I'm grateful that you've hired me. I will perform my duties admirably. I know you will, Mr. Haig. I have taken into consideration your many years of government service. However, this is a, this is a tough administration. Every single person here, Mr. Kissinger, can testify to this. We have one, one goal, and that is peace with honor in South Vietnam. The, the tractors in the press are trying to pin this all on the Watergate matter. That's absolutely not true. But listen here, we have one motto, and one motto only, and that is if one of us goes down, we all go down. Mr. Kissinger has learned this the difficult way. And I made myself quite clear. Yes, sir. Well, good. Then we'll have no problems. You begin the morning. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. President, Congress is considering four articles of impeachment. I recommend that you show those tapes to prove that we are innocent. For what? To prove that John Dean is a liar. <laughs> well, of course John Dean is a liar. He's just some rinky-dink kid we brought off the street with. You think uh, you think we can afford, you think every kid that comes in here with a law degree has every credibility? No. I think they're going to let me go out there and scream, mea culpa, mea culpa. No. No, they're all, they're always out to get Nixon, see? They're not going to let us give up this easy. No. Man doesn't cry. I don't cry. We're gonna fight. We're gonna fight to the end. You go back and you stick it to him. We're not gonna. We're just not gonna buckle these people. We're gonna make them choke. And the only thing I know is we're doing the best for this country because that's what we were elected to do. We're we're the honest. We're the best. So let's let's go out there and fight. Yes, Mr. President. Okay, let's go. All right, thank you. John, I just got word from the Justice Department that that prosecutor Richardson hired, Archibald Cox, he wants to investigate us for Watergate. He wants to subpoena the tapes. I'm not gonna let him do that. I want you to fire Archibald Cox. 
I can't, sir. He works for the Attorney General. Then fire the Attorney General! Tell, tell Elliot Richardson, if he doesn't fire him, then I'll fire all of them. I don't care if you have to fire everyone. Clear down to the janitor in the Justice Department. Just do it, okay? All right. Good. Mr. President, I think you may have abused your powers. The press has labeled the firings as a Saturday Night Massacre. Well, of course they do that. There's no one in this office, get The press is the enemy. I mean, they're trying to destroy us. Jesus Christ, they're trying to destroy us. So they impeach, so they want to fire a couple people. Screw them. You two need to learn something and learn it quick. The press is the enemy from now on. Got it? Yes, Mr. President. Good. Now, get out there and you tell those reporters that nothing is wrong and that we're perfectly in the Constitution. Got it? Good. Now, get Mr. Secretary, I fear we have a large problem. Why is that? I fear that Mr. Nixon has completely lost all touch with reality. Hello, boys. Mr. President. <clears throat> I just got back from the press briefing down there. i never seen such disrespectful kids in all my life. Why is that, Mr. President? Th those kids are useless. They just ask reporters, all these reporters, what about Watergate? What, what's the president doing about Watergate? Is the president going to resign? Which they love that. They love to see me go out screaming for mercy. Well, I'm not going to get it. I saw what, uh, I read your recommendation on the tapes. The answer is no. Do you really think it's good to release those tapes? I do. Fine. Tomorrow night we'll go on the television and explain to the nation that I will be releasing the transcripts of the tapes and uh, we'll let Rosemary Woods screen them ahead of time, okay? Yes. Okay, now, Mr. Secretary, and then I want you to get down there and, and handle those reporters, understand? Yes, Mr. President. Good, good. We might still be able to turn this thing around. Mr. President, Russia has threatened to invade Egypt. What, 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 what do you want? What, what do you want? <laughs> Never mind. I'm gonna go upstairs, handle the situation from the control room, from the situation room, and if you need me, don't let anybody get there, okay? No staffers. No, no, nothing. Got it? Yes, Mr. President. Good. Oh, and, and... No, 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 never mind. And I want to say this to the television audiences as well. In all my years of public service, I have never profited, never profited from public service. I have never obstructed justice. And... May I just say, I welcome this kind of examination because I think people ought to know whether or not their president's a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. I've earned everything I've got. Yes, sir. Good evening. I have asked for this time tonight to announce my answer to the House Judiciary Committee's subpoena for additional Watergate tapes and to tell you something about the actions I shall be taking tomorrow, about what I hope they will mean to you and about the very difficult choices that were presented to me. These actions will at last, once and for all, show that what I knew and what I did regard to the Watergate break-in and cover-up were just as I have described them to you from the very beginning. As I have spent many hours during the past few weeks thinking about what I would say to the American people if I were to reach the decision I shall announce tonight, and so my words have not been chosen lightly. I assure you they are deeply felt. It was almost two years ago, in June 1972, that five men broke into the Democratic National Committee headquarters in Washington. It turned out that they were connected with my re-election committee, 
and the Watergate break-in became a major issue in the campaign. The full resources of the FBI and the Justice Department were used to investigate the incident thoroughly. I instructed my staff and campaign aides to cooperate fully with the investigation. The FBI conducted nearly 1,500 interviews. For nine months, until March 1973, I was assured by those charges with, with conducting and monitoring the investigations that no one in the White House was involved. Nevertheless, for more than a year, there have been allegations and insinuations that I knew about the planning of the Watergate break-in, and that I was involved in an extensive plot to cover it up. The House Judiciary Committee is now investigating these charges. On March 6th, I ordered all materials that had been previously furnished to the special prosecutor turned over to the committee. These included tape recordings of 19 presidential conversations and more than 700 documents from private White House files. On April 11th, the House Judiciary Committee issued a subpoena for 42 additional tapes of conversations which it contended were necessary for its investigation. I agreed to respond to that subpoena by tomorrow. They also include transcripts of the other conversations which were not subpoenaed, but which have a significant bearing on the question of presidential actions with regard to Watergate. These will be delivered to the committee tomorrow. In these transcripts, portions are not relevant to my knowledge or actions with regard to Watergate, but are not included. But everything is relevant, is included, the, tough, the rough as well as the smooth strategy sessions, the exploration of alternatives, the weighting of human and political costs. As far as what the President personally knew and did with regard to Watergate, and the cover-up is concerned. These materials, together with those already made available, will tell it all. I hope and trust that when you have seen the evidence in its entirety, that you will see the truth of the statement. As for myself, I intend to go forward, to the best of my ability, with the work that you elected me to do. I shall do so in spirit, perhaps summed up a century ago by another president, when he was being subjected to unmerciful attack. Abraham Lincoln said, I do the very best I know how, the very best I can, and I mean to keep doing it so until the end. If the end brings me out all right, what I said against me won't amount to anything. But if the end brings me out wrong, ten, ten angels swearing I was right would make no difference. Thank you, and good evening. <laughs> Mr. President, the Supreme Court has ordered that you return the remaining 18 minutes of the tapes. And why would I do that? Well, you can either fight it or comply. Mr. Hay, <clears throat> while I regret this decision completely, for the good of this nation and for the security of the country, I will authorize the release of the tapes for full investigation. Order Rosemary Woods, my secretary, to have that 18 minutes delivered to the Senate Watergate Committee. It's done. And I suspect now they're going to abortion side of office. It's done. It's done. Rosemary, did you get those tapes from Al Haig? I did, sir. Good. Get rid of them. Make it look like an accident. Do whatever you have to do, but no one is ever going to call Richard Nixon a failure again. The Senate Watergate Committee want to make me look like a fool! They can't do it. They just can't do it. Democrats come too far to lose now. Do whatever it is you have to do. Make it look like an accident. If we're going down, we're going to take him down with us. Rose. 
you and I have known each other a long time. They're going to take us all down. They're going to take me down. They're going to take you down. They've taken Bob. They've taken John. Now they're going to get rid of the, they're going to get rid of the whole presidency. All in one stroke. No. No, no, no. Get rid, get rid of the tapes. That's all there is in the discussion. Got it? Yes, sir. Good. Rosemary, I, uh, as you probably know, I'm, uh, gonna have to resign. They, uh, they got the tapes, kiddo. You know, uh, remember those days out in California? Back when I was vice president? Just told those, uh... <laughs> Just told those reporters they wouldn't have Nixon to kick around anymore. Well, they didn't. At least I thought they didn't. I impeached myself. Brought myself down by resigning. I screwed up real good. Well, you know what? We can... I don't care what they say. We can be proud of what we've done. That's always what we're going to have to remember, is that we're the best. We know best for this country. And that's just what we got to remember. So let's, uh, we're going to go upstairs, going to talk to Al Haig, and we'll figure out something. And we'll go quiet. And that's what we're going to do. Good evening. This is the 37th time I have spoken to you from this office, in which so many decisions have been made that shape the history of this nation. Each time I have done so, to discuss with you some important matters which I believe have affected the national interest. And all the decisions I have made in my public life, I have always tried to do what was best for the nation. Throughout the long and difficult period of Watergate, I have felt it was my duty to persevere, to make every possible effort to complete the term of office to which you elected me. In the past few days, however, it has become evident to me that I no longer have a, lo have a strong enough political base in the Congress to justify continuing that effort. As long as there was such a base, I felt strongly that it was necessary to see the constitutional process through to its conclusion. To do otherwise would be unfaithful to the spirit of that deliberately difficult process and a dangerously destabilizing precedent for the future. But with the disappearance of that base, I now believe that the constitutional purpose has been served, and there is no longer a need for the process to be prolonged. I would have preferred to carry through to the finish whatever the personal agony it would have involved, and my family unanimously urged me to do so. But the interests of the nation must always come before any personal considerations. From the discussions I have had with congressional and other leaders, I have concluded that because of the Watergate matter, I might not have the support of Congress that I would consider necessary to back the very difficult decisions and carry out the duties of this office in the way the interests of the nation require. I have never been a quitter. To leave office before my term is completed is opposed to every instinct in my body. But as president, I must always put the interests of America first. America needs a full-time president and a full-time Congress, particularly at this time with problems we face at home and abroad. To continue to fight through the months ahead for my personal vindication would almost totally absorb the time and attention of both the president and the Congress in a period when our entire focus should be on the great issues of peace abroad and prosperity without inflation at home. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Vice President Ford will be sworn in as president at that hour in this office. I recall the high hopes for America which, with which we began this second term. I feel a great sadness that I will not be here in this office working on your behalf to achieve those goals over the next two and a half years. But in turning over direction of the government to Vice President Ford, I know, as I told the nation when I nominated him for that office 10 months ago, that the leadership of America 
will be in good hands. In passing this office to the Vice President, I also do so with profound sense of the weight and responsibility that will fall on his shoulders tomorrow, and therefore of the understanding, the patience, the cooperation he will need from all Americans. I shall leave with regret for not finishing my term in office, but with gratitude for the privilege of serving as your president for these past five and a half years. These years have been a momentous time in the history of our nation and the world. They have been a time of achievement in which we can all be proud of the achievements that represent the shared efforts of this administration, the Congress and the people. But the challenges ahead are equally great and they too will require the support and the efforts of Congress and the people working in cooperation with the new administration. We have ended America's longest war, but in the work of securing a lasting peace in the world, the goals ahead are more far reaching and more difficult. We must complete the structure of peace so that it will be said of this generation, our generation of Americans, by people of all the nations, not only that we ended one war, but that we prevented future wars. I pledge to you tonight that as long as I have breath of life in my body, I shall continue in that spirit. I shall continue to work for the great causes to which I have dedicated throughout my years as a congressman, a senator, vice president, and president. The cause of peace not just for America, but among all nations. Prosperity, justice, and opportunity for all people. There is one cause above all to which I have devoted and to which I shall always be devoted for as long as I shall live. When I first took the oath of office as president five and a half years ago, I made this sacred commitment to consecrate my office, my energies, and all my wisdom that I can summon to the cause of peace among nations. As a result of these efforts, I am confident that the world is a safer place today, not only for the people of America, but for the nations and all the people of those nations, and all that our children have a better chance than before of living in peace rather than dying in a war. This, more than anything, is what I hoped to achieve when I sought the presidency. This, more than anything, is what I hope to achieve, to, is what I hope will be my legacy to you, to our country, as I leave the presidency. To have served in this office is to have felt a very personal sense of kinship with each and every American. In leaving it, I do so in prayer. May God's grace be with all of you in the days ahead. Mr. President, are you prepared to give your resignation speech? Yeah, yeah, I am. I, uh, I was, uh, I was saying goodbye to all the, to all the staff people downstairs, and I was, I was, um, uh, I was telling the girls, you know, I mean, uh, Julie just sat there and cried because her. Father was leaving. I didn't want those girls to have to put up with their father being a loser. No one can call Richard Nixon a loser. That's why we're here. That's what we do. But you know what, boys? I do it all again. Because you know what? I don't know what they're going to say about us a hundred years from now. I don't know what they're going to say about us tomorrow. But I know this. They have to call us peacemakers, because that's who we are, we're peacemakers, and I do it again. Well, let's, uh, let's go down there and give them one final show. Thank you. I think the record should show that this is one of those, uh, spontaneous things we always arrange whenever the president comes in to speak. And it will be so reported in the press and we don't mind because they have to call as they see it. 
But on our part, believe me, it is spontaneous. You're here to say goodbye to us, and we don't have a good word for it in English. The best is au revoir. We'll see you again. I just met with the members of the White House staff, those who serve here at the White House day in and day out, and I asked them to do what I ask all of you to do to the extent that you can, and of course you are requested to do. Serve our next president as you have served me and served previous presidents. Because many of you have been here for many years and with devotion and dedication because this office, great as it is, can only be as great as the men and women who work for and with the president. This house has a great heart, and the heart comes from those who serve. I was rather sorry they didn't come down. We said goodbye to them upstairs. But they're really great. And I recall after so many times I've made speeches, and some of them were pretty tough. Yet, I would always come back after a hard day, and my days usually run rather long. And I would always get a lift from them, because I might be a little down, but they always smiled. And so it is with you. I look around, and I see so many on the staff that, you know, should have been by your offices, shaking hands, let you tell me how to run the world. <laughs> Everyone wants to tell the president what to do. And boy, he needs to be told. But I just haven't had the time. But I want you to know that each and every one of you are indispensable to this government. We could be proud of it, five and a half years. No man or no woman came into this administration and left it with more of the world's goods than when he came in. No man or woman ever profited at the public expense on the public till. That tells me something about you. Mistakes, yes, but for personal gain, never. You did what you believed in, sometimes right, sometimes wrong. And I only wish that I were a wealthy man. At the present time, I gotta find a way to pay my taxes. But I, and if I were, I would like to recompense you for the sacrifices that you have all made to this government. But you are getting something in government, and I want you to tell this to your children, and I hope the nation's children will listen. Something in government service is far more important than money. It's the cause of something bigger than yourself. It's the cause of making this the greatest nation in the world, because without us, what will the world know? The world will know nothing but war, possibly starvation, or worse, in the years ahead. With our leadership, it will know peace, and it will know plenty. We have been generous, and we will be more generous in the future as we are able to. But most important, we must be strong here, strong in our hearts, strong in our souls, strong in our belief, and strong in our willingness to sacrifice as you have been willing to sacrifice in a pecuniary way to serve in this government. And I say to them, there are many fine careers. This country needs good farmers, good businessmen, good plumbers, good carpenters. I remember my old man. I think they would have called him a sort of little man, a common man. He didn't consider himself that way. You know what he was? He was a streetcar motorman first, 
Then he was a farmer. Then he had a lemon ranch. And it was the poorest lemon ranch in California, I can assure you. He sold it before they found oil on it. And then he was a grocer. But he was a great man. Because he did his job, and every job counts up to the hilt, regardless of what happens. Nobody will ever write a book, probably, about my mother. Well, I guess all of you would describe this as your mother. My mother was a saint. And I think of her, the two boys dying of tuberculosis, nursing four others that she could take care of my older brother for three years in Arizona, and seeing each of them die. And when they died, it was like one of her own. Yes, she will have no books written about her, but she was a saint. Now, we look to the future. I had a little quote in the speech last night from T.R. As you know, I kind of like to read books. I'm not educated, but I do read books. And T.R. quote was a pretty good one. There's another I found when I was reading my last night in the White House. This quote is about a young man. He was a young lawyer in New York. He'd married a beautiful girl. And he had a lovely daughter. And then suddenly, she died. And this was what he wrote in his diary. He said, She was beautiful in face and form, and lovelier still in spirit. As a, flower, as a flower she grew, and as a fair young flower she died. Her life had always been in the sunshine. There had never come to her a single great sorrow, and none ever do, knew her who did not love and revere her for her bright and sunny temper and her saintly unselfishness. Fair, pure, joyous as a maiden, loving, tender, and happy as a young wife. She had just become a mother, and when her life seemed to just begun, when the years seemed so bright before her, then by a strange and terrible fate, death came to her. And when my heart's dearest die, died, the light went from my life forever. That was T.R. in his twenties though he thought the light had gone from his life forever. But he went on, and he went on not only to become president, but as an ex-president, he served his country. Always in the arena, tempestuous, strong, sometimes wrong, sometimes right. But he was a man. It is always, only a beginning, always. The young must know it, the old must know it, it must always sustain us, because the greatness comes not always when things go well for you, but when you take some knocks, some disappointments, some sadness comes, because only if you've been in the deepest valley can you know how magnificent it is to be on the highest mountain. And so I say to you on this occasion, as we leave, we leave proud of the people who have stood by us and worked for us and served this country. We want you to be proud of what you have done. We want you to continue to serve in government, if that is your wish. Always give your best. Never be discouraged. Never be petty. Always remember, others may hate you, but those who hate you don't win unless you hate them. And then you destroy yourself. And so, we leave with high hopes, in good spirit, and with deep humility, and with very much gratefulness in our hearts. I can only say to each and every one of you, we may come from many faiths, that we may worship different gods, but really the same God in a sense. But I want to say to each and every one of you, not only will we always remember you. Not only will we always be grateful to you, 
that you will be in our hearts and always will you be in our prayers. Thank you very much.